welcome, welcome. Welcome to Kudas Seminar, Badum Culture House, and our panel discussion, Hip Hop and the Stage. My name is Belinda Brasa, and I will be your moderator. Today, we will talk about the status quo for hip hop, focusing mainly on the dance element. But as some of us know, talking about hip hop will take us on a roller coaster ride through topics like cultural heritage, cultural capital, acknowledgement, advocacy, ownership, social status, social mobility. The list is long. One can almost not talk about hip hop in any of its elements or art forms without it being political. To understand why, one must know the history of hip hop and as it was born under struggling conditions uh, and in a way became an opponent art form. Today, we'll assume that our audience and viewers know a little bit about the backdrop and try to focus on the discussion at large. Namely, where is hip hop today and where does it go from here? With me on stage this evening, I have some very qualified people who has taken the challenge of digging into this discussion and hopefully getting us closer to the core. Because, as I mentioned earlier, this discussion has a tendency to chew over a very large chunk that contains politics, social structure, past and future at the same time. Before we start, I would like to just read the official description of our topic uh, of discussion this evening. Uh, that was on the Facebook event, yadi yadi. Urban dance and hip hop are sometimes described as the most contemporary dance there is, a living expression of what the dancers executing it is engaged with. It is a fugitive art form and a rebel, as modern dance once was in relation to ballet. Yet, it is still restricted today in the realm of contemporary dance. Contemporary dance is reserved for art, forms operating inside certain exclusive contexts, for example, institutional theaters, and within certain funding streams. Hip hop has not been fully enveloped into this exclusive structure. What kind of frictions emerge? What kind of possibilities do we have? The panel today consists of Matthias Jinbutz. He is the co-founder of Substance, Soul Sessions Oslo, that organize numerous battles, events, and happenings and is also a part of the crew Deep Down Dopism. He has his education from Flow Dance Academy in Copenhagen and King Wings crew, oh, sorry, uh, and has continued his education through field trips to Paris, New York, Los Angeles and Seoul. He has worked in theaters across Norway, collaborated with companies like Frikar and Impure Company, as well as teaching at numerous dance educations in Scandinavia. Thomas Preste, is the artistic director and founder of Tabanka Dance Ensemble, one of the few full-time black dance companies in Europe. Tabanka draws from African-Caribbean diasporan movement and dance practices in order to create contemporary work. Tabanka also challenges tropes and posits that these practices are contemporary in and of themselves. Thomas has had an international career spanning over 25 years, looks very young, and 48 countries. He is now internationally most known for the Talawa technique, uh, uh, one of the few fully codified uh, Africana dance techniques. Anne Nien is an award-winning choreographer and the founder of Compagnie Parterre, based in France. She has her background from breaking and martial arts, and before she started her journey as a choreographer, she was a heavy-hitting B-girl, representing in numerous battles around the world. She has produced a wide range of performances and shows that are touring the world, and her work concentrates on, this is quoting from her, gestures as a symbol, the body as the object of ownership, movement as a primary need, the stage as a priority platform for sharing. Sean Graham is an international choreographer and movement director. Graham has received several awards from dance associations, including Talawa State of Emergency, the uh, Association of Dance of the African Diasporan, and Trinity Laban Conservatoire. Besides being an active creator and performer, Graham has invested in creating spaces and platforms for artists at the grassroots level, on their own terms. Graham's work has been uh, staged at the South Bank Center, Rich Mix, Stratford Circus, The Place, 
Royal Opera House, Royal School of Ballet and Sadler's Wells. Welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to uh, being here. I've done a little bit of research, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the thing we do agree on is that hip hop is contemporary. Yes? Yes. And thank you for tonight. <laughs> nah, okay, okay. <laughs> If we talk about hip-hop entering the stage, um, let's go back to the text that is the official one. What kind of frictions emerge? I'm not going to point at anyone or, you know, just jump at the microphone when you want to talk. I'll stop you if you start to fight. Uh, what kind of frictions emerge? What kind of possibilities do we have? And go. <laughs> no, I'm just going to um, keep it short. I mean, some of the frictions are really about hip hop itself, in, in the sense of um, when we enter it into institutions, what are we leaving out? And that becomes a real issue for some people. For some people, it is it doesn't um, have any effect on. So you know, in terms of the history of hip-hop itself and its culture, that seems to build a lot of the friction, mostly, about that, that transition into institutions and what will be lost um, in terms of, you know, there will be vanguards who really want to hold on to the cultural element and the actual aesthetics of the, of the form itself seems to be what's for the taking. And that's going to be... That is the struggle, I believe, because you're going to have people who, it's really, you know, for them it's about the culture. They don't have to go on B-Boy, they don't have to go on MC. They're actually there in the, you know, in the actual culture of things. Whilst they're viewing somebody else who's going to school, who's come from, you know, around the corner, who has nothing to do with um, where the culture comes from, they're obtaining these skills and saying, you know what, yeah, I'm hip-hop now, and that's it. And it's not to knock anybody that does go to school and, and learn these techniques. Um, I'm sure those people would ride or die for, as one would say in the hip-hop term, um, for, for, their, you know, for what they feel that they love. But it doesn't necessarily um, obtain the whole culture. It doesn't necessarily consider the whole culture. And it's not necessarily all an academic um, experience. Sometimes things are lived. And how is that translated? What is that word, I would say, um, that cultural capital that you obtain through experience rather than thinking of it as a, um, a heady subject, which it, is, which it isn't in itself. That's one problem. On the other side of it, it is things cannot be stagnant. Things will not be stagnant, no, no matter if I personally feel, in terms of my own upbringing, that I may be more closer to hip-hop than somebody else the institutions and the, the actual macro, um, macro system, the macro of the um, sort of system that which is in, is going to move on regardless of my faults, regardless of my cultural commitments and sort of um, values. So am I going to be angry at that? Am I going to stay angry or how am I going to utilize that? Is, the, is what I need to think for myself and think not just by myself but collectively because if we do um, start to you know hold on and not understand these um, principles it's really going to continue to be heated arguments with no resolve because on one end you have the, uh, um, the resource of the hip hop um, and then those who are taken from that resource they're in a much more powerful position and it's not really a battle, you know what I mean? So you could be arguing all day, and, and the person who has the power will be like, yeah, cool, all right, thanks, okay, bye. I'm gone, mm. you know what I mean? Any follow-ups? What kind of frictions? Um, I like to see hip-hop as an individual thing. At least that's how I got attracted to it. Um, for me, uh, I started around 98, something like that. I was in Montreal at the time. 
Um, and I did martial arts before. For me, it's like a contemporary martial arts, uh, some way to build your personal identity, resist um, being anonymous, resist um, uh, a sedentary, sedentary lifestyle. Uh, it's like being able to uh, be unique in a world where everybody is more and more uh, the same. Um, and that's why I got attracted to hip hop. And um, I, um, I, I was listening to what everybody was saying in the previous discussion. Um, and I just want to point out something about um, how hip hop was born, j j just a quick um, view. Um, let's remember that it came from um, um, trying to stop the gangs from fighting. So trying to avoid a sort of tribalism, a sort of um, um, way to define yourself by your group before defining yourself by um, your own uh, abilities, um, your own whatever. Um, and um, so I think um, hip hop is a kind of um, structure, actually, the, if you speak about the hip hop culture, is a kind of structure that helps you attain status in another way, uh, which is a bit counterculture. Like um, if you don't have status in the I don't know, um, uh, main uh, domains like money, whatever, you can have status because you're an amazing dancer and when people see you in, in, in the dark and they, only see, they don't even see your face, they can recognize the way you move and they can see, oh, um, he was there or she was there or whatever. And so um, it, it's a kind of uh, structure that um, enables people to be strong individuals and to define themselves individually. Um, and that's what I liked about hip hop. Um, and I, I'm, sometimes I, um, I get kind of sad when I hear people uh, who first of all um, want to represent hip hop as a group thing first uh, and not as, uh, an, I don't know what, you, like it's for me it's not um, a group thing. It's a um, structure and there's values, but it's a structure to make you be a strong individual. So, so I think it's a bit of a contradiction. Definitely. I am sure that uh, other, I'm looking at Thomas, wants to reply uh, your... Uh, <laughs> Take the microphone. So the question was, is it on? Mm. Okay. The question was frictions, right? Frictions. Yay. Um, well, my first friction was actually in the text itself, where it says, like modern dance in relation to ballet. That's my first friction, I would actually say. For me, that becomes extremely constructive, uh, because modern dance answers ballet in a way that hip-hop doesn't really answer neither ballet nor what came before hip-hop on the same genealogy of it as hip-hop. But there's this need always to put it in some kind of parallel too, and even sometimes into the same timeline, which I would say for me is the first friction. <laughs> uh, the second friction for me has, also, has been earlier today and so on as well, um, in kind of the relation of where we talk about how things came about or what it was and what it wasn't. Um, I think we sometimes forget, for example, when we say that it used to be both jazz and hip-hop and so on used to be circular, it used to be all of these things, that the first stages in America and in the Caribbean were the auction blocks, where there actually was a stage and black bodies performing and an audience, and that genealogy is also present in jazz and is also present in these other styles. It's still there. There's a retention there. So it's not just this social nice space where everyone was happy and together and folk. There was a very different history and we have a tendency to make it all hygienic. And it was never hygienic in that way. And it was never just happy in that way, but it was a happy in spite of, which is a very powerful thing. Um, and it's also where my entry point is. My entry point is maybe where most other people's obscurity is. Because a lot of styles will say, yeah, yeah, it started with African. 
and then we never touch what does that mean. For example, even it started with African Americans, or we say it started with African Americans, Latin Americans, and Caribbeans meeting. Okay, who met? What met? Who are these people? These people came on the same boat, different stops. So that is not actually vastly separated different cultures that met. Those are people with the same history, same culture, same rhythmical practices, same movement practices, who are meeting again. And that meeting again was not about gangs not fighting. That was not what that meeting again was about for those people and those bodies. So that also becomes a friction for me where that's a story that serves somebody else's agenda and history and what they want to say about themselves. Second friction. Um, almost done. Um, but also, that being said, there's also friction in this whole rainbow image of hip-hop where in hip-hop we're all equal, everything is rainbow. That's another friction because as it moves, just like jazz, when we say that when it moves onto stage, it move, loses some politics, it doesn't move on to just onto stage, it moves from one body with a specific history and position in society to another body with a completely different mobility. So what jazz has proven is jazz is socially mobile. The body it started on is not necessarily socially mobile. The question is, are we experiencing the same with hip-hop? That somebody is left behind as the genre is moving. And so that's my next question, and which also leads to my last one to bring it back to Norway. I'm sometimes now wondering if the Maria, since you were in the panel earlier, of today would be able to use hip-hop the way Maria used it then. Uh, because I also have to acknowledge that from our generation, uh, black don't crack, thank God, uh, till now, there's not been produced that many from those perspectives. So I also have to call to attention that there seems to be some exclusion processes still going on in hip-hop as much as hip-hop is being presented as being catch one, catch all, each one, teach one, we're all family. Can you elaborate on that last point? What, what exactly does that mean? Who is not being produced? What oh, are you we? Oh, one specificity. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, in Maria's chime in, in Maria's generation and mine, there were not many uh, of us who were black specifically, but there were larger communities that were engaged. Uh, Maria was, uh, I would not say she was produced in a way, she produced herself, because I also remember when Maria entered the stage, and Maria actually made it okay to be black in hip hop for a lot of bodies and a lot of people, because that wasn't actually completely accepted, but she just spread out and it really changed the environment of the community, especially for girls, I will say, uh, especially for girls. Um, and being another black body, I will also say for me, because her presence, I just also want to acknowledge that your presence really changed how it was. Uh, then her brother coming from the same uh, is another one. Then you have to go almost all the way to Austin. Uh, I'm now saying names that international people don't know. Before you get uh, other black bodies, not bodies of color, but specifically black, who have been invested in from that community that has gotten opportunity to teach, has been invested in as artists, etc. And there, in a genre where you should feel so at home that it doesn't necessarily carry your voice on and you somehow, by chance or by system, are not the ones invested in. Uh, so I'm leaving it by chance or by system, but regardless, the end result is there's a lot of people who are somehow falling outside of the structure. Um, and I don't mean that that means they're falling out of it because of ill intent. I'm just pointing out they are falling out. We need to catch them because this is one space they really should be falling into. I really agree. I really agree with that, especially your um, comments on the body and the art form taking different journeys. It started, it started in black bodies and how it's gone into a different, um, you know, black bodies have been left behind. Um, and that's why I was talking about the um, commercial, com cultural capital in the sense of, you know, something being... The, the black body, as you were saying earlier on, the black body has always been something that has um, been put there to be consumed, right? <laughs> to be consumed and, you know, 
it's always been historically that it's been taken. And it's almost this idea as well that that self-perpetuation that you know, we've gone through. Has anyone heard of Willie Lynch? Nobody in the room. Willie Lynch. Okay. Mm, go and learn. <laughs> uh, Willie Lynch was a slave owner who, um, who came, he was, he was um, we say, commissioned to solve a problem amongst slave owners who were losing slaves because they were rebelling and they were committing suicide. And the slave masters were, all they were doing was just, uh, you know, punishing them, making them, you know what I mean, making them pay it, and they was losing more slaves. Willie Lynch just said, um, that's, that's not the way, the best way to do it is to turn them amongst themselves. And the, the, the young against the old, the light against the dark, and so on and so on. And um, that will self-perpetuate for years, hundreds of years to come. And that, um, it's almost taking on and assimilating that idea. So it was set in motion that this is what you should be doing. Hating, I should be hating you. You should be hating me as black people. And it's just that pattern of behavior that's been set. And when I, was just, when I just started speaking, I was speaking about the, the black body being made for consumption. And it's almost as that, um, that self-reflection that you know, when you look at the history of jazz, you're just explaining about where it actually came, came from. But then there's that part where the, the black artist may then turn it to be into more performance. It's about to sell in it. How can I turn it to sell? You were talking earlier on, you know, having an idea about the aesthetics, it becomes an aesthetic um, form which we can sell to the institutions, those who are paying, soften it up, capital, you know, cultural capital, until we can get a seat at a table. Hence, bodies are being left behind. <clears throat> and um, I think those little details really need to be breathed in and considered as, um, as we go forward in terms of what other conflicts, because it's a history of things, whether it be through jazz. When people think about jazz nowadays, people say it's lift music. It's, you know, it's a white man's lift music. Not, not such a <laughs> thing. But it's because things have been, again, from, the, from that experience, being consumed and turned into cultural capital and sold on. And once it's been gotten used up, those who are left behind have to go and create something else. Hence you have those, you may witness, I mean, being younger in the sense of those little struggles you have when, okay, hip hop dance was here, crump came. For a moment, it's that struggle. No, we're not hip hop, we're something else. Because that's a nature, that's a, a nature. And they, nobody may know, those people who are pioneering these things may not know this really niche sort of, syndrome but you can see how things are set into its own cycle um hip-hop versus um call it trap trap music or yeah you know i mean all those other styles trying to separate yourself so i can stand out so i can sell to you who are willing to consume me and that's what that's something that really is for me personally and i think for a lot of people it's not worth spoken about if we're going to get any progression there needs to be some sort of collective understanding of those elements that need to be addressed. That's why I said earlier, it's not just academic. Um, so you have to include that. How are you going to do it as an institution? You can throw a lot of money at it, but it's not going to happen so easily. I'm not going to say no to everything. I'm just going to say just these are the challenges that you have where I also agree in the sense of um, the, content, the idea, that little irk at, uh, we can agree it's contemporary, right? I'm like, mm, because actually they, you know, in terms of the postmodernism, it, it is a dance form. There's the, it's, it's a specific sort of um, form, whereas hip hop comes with a culture. It's almost saying, oh yeah, we can take that, you know what I mean? And then we won, but yeah, I think there's, there's a lot more to be considered as well. Matias, you don't necessarily have a black body. Are you feeling left behind? That's why I was wearing this today. Mm. <laughs> Trying to be more hip-hop, you know. <laughs> yeah, because can no. you claim it then? What? Can yeah. you claim it then? Yeah, I, I, I was thinking about the uh, panel talk that we had, and this is not to give a shout-out to myself, but we had a panel talk <laughs> doing Soul Sessions <laughs> Extended a couple of weeks ago that was about cultural appropriation or 
like approaching that subject, which is kind of merged with what we're talking about now. Mm. And uh, oh my God, it's I'm really, really afraid in a way to talk about this subject because it's really complex and hard. And I think it's that's the first thing I want to say. That's my that's my that's my no no. But I mean like also for everybody that are in here because majority are white that was the the talk that we had there was about that so also when we approach that talk we i think it's that's the first step we take it's really hard to talk about because it's so complex and so um so for me uh, i i i'm a little afraid of not separating the talk between understanding where it comes from and all the structural problems that we have versus the individual feeling that people have um, adopting or culture. Uh, so, because what Thomas said about uh, the black body and everything, I, I agree. And I, if I can agree when I don't have the so deep knowledge about it, but I, I, I appreciate your point of view and I think it makes sense to me. The thing that's hard is that when you use the local um, family tree or whatever as an example, then it becomes really hard for me because the, the, the talk that we had there was about within, why is it? Okay, I'll just speak loud no matter <laughs> what. Um, so so my question, without trying to start any crazy discussion, or I'm I'm just wondering when you say that and you talk, uh, use Maria's example and Austin as example. My point of view is that okay, so Marikin or Osman or even the my Chinese sister over there, mm -mm. you know, all Asians are from China, right? They are they not? I mean. I think when you say what you say, I think some people, and I say it also because I can feel that feel, I can feel that myself, maybe feel that if you're a dark skinned, you have a larger right to take ownership to the culture. And that's when I get confused because uh, you can grow, like me, I grew up in Denmark, but I'm from Korea originally, but I feel Danish. So, so for instance, Maria, you were, you grew up here in Norway. So, but you're dark skinned, and because the culture has uh, heritage and uh, roots, then you would probably feel that it's easy if, or if you knew the history. Or let me turn it around. The, the white girl next to you would maybe feel that she doesn't have the same rights to the culture as you, just because of the skin color. And that's where I get uh, uh, a little confused about this kind of conversation, because I'm, I don't agree, but at the same time, I'm really scared to say it. So, yeah. Good. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> Anne, Anne has, a, yeah. has the first. Uh, so... Um, uh, for me, um, dance is something that's um, as old as humankind. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so um, it's um, dance and like the kind of um, strong um, dances like hip hop when it breaking when it started cramp uh, rec more recently maybe manifest themselves in contexts where you have a lot of struggle or a lot of um, uh, context that uh, pushes people to find a new way out. It's like a kind of a survival thing, like uh, you have to invent something because you're not, maybe you're not in the game or you don't relate to the structure. And so um, uh, art firms uh, have a tendency to manifest themselves in that the struggle context. But that's not um, exclusive to breaking or cramp. Or I think um, you can find that uh, forever in history. 
and you can find that also on an individual level. Um, usually avant-garde artists are people who struggle with something, maybe it's personal, maybe it's a relationship to women, maybe it's, I don't know, to their mother, whatever, <laughs> or their father. But um, the, the art is something that we, uh, it, it pushes the boundaries because we need to do it. So I think um, everybody um, universally uh, uh, has the right to um, relate to um, any culture that rings uh, with their own um, feeling of not belonging to whatever it is. Uh, it can be um, psychological, it doesn't have to be um, social or um, economic. Uh, and so, yeah, I think um, we have, um, I take a more Jungian pers perspective on it, is that um, uh, it's a quote that people don't have ideas, ideas have people, ideas are universal and they, they are strongly um, built in our systems and our cultures um, and they manifest themselves uh, in situations that, uh, are, uh, that help them as catalysts. But once ideas manifest themselves, we are, um, well, ideas belong to humankind. And uh, I will go a little, a little bit uh, more into the um, topic that we were talking about today. Um, is hip hop a postmodern form? Or, because I, let's say, you say contemporary in a postmodern way. Mm -hmm. So what is postmodernism? It's like um, questioning meaning, uh, trying to uh, cut down the pieces to make sense of things or uh, take away sense, whatever. Um, I think um, hip hop has a strong relationship to that because uh, hip hop is not about reappropriation but reinvention and sampling in music and in dance. Um, it's all about um, um, taking in the world and um, putting it together in a personal way and also in a collective way uh, that is more um, maybe um, uh, relationship to to the earth, to something more uh, tribal, like uh, the bounce. Um, but um, hip hop um, is the artistic potential of people who who were in a certain context and saw things that were around them. So for me, hip hop is inspired by uh, architecture, like the the, the big. Um, uh, huge buildings that constrain you, make you feel small uh, by uh, the way you dress, uh, uh, wearing shoes all the time, uh, wearing big clothes and stuff that uh, also change your movements. It's inspired by air, uh, popular culture like kung fu movies uh, that were very present uh, when hip hop uh, for breaking first started in, in, uh, in the Bronx and uh, uh, animals, whatever, many things. And you don't sometimes you're not even conscious that uh, what you are um, um, go giving out is something that you were inspired by because um, inspiration is, is a very strange thing. But uh, for me, uh, ideas belong to everybody. So my question is, uh, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. Thomas had a reply to Matthias. Yes. Uh, first of all, acknowledging that the conversations are hard. Uh, they are extremely hard because they are extremely complicated and they're not, like I said, built on a history of niceness. And it's not a history that is over. It's a history that is continuing today. Um, and that is part of what is being raised. So I'm raising structural things. Um, where, But I will be specific. The very people that was called out in the audience, for example, Hing and me collaborate and have collaborated for, what, 15 years close to? And I've invested quite a lot into her artistry as she has invested into my artistry. Uh, the same goes for the other people in the room. So I've never at any point said that a white body or an Asian body can't enter, can't be, can't have ownership. Not being said in any way, not even alluded to. What I'm saying is that this expression came specifically from a vantage point, was created and produced by a body in order to create some space for that body in the world because the world was suffocating it. I'm saying it is a shame if that space that was created no longer can room that body, because that body is now, to be very precise, and even this conversation partly shows it, is a threat to everyone else's ownership, 
because the question once a black body comes in and the question of history and so on comes in, this question of ownership also comes in. And then sometimes it's easier to remove the body because that removes the difficult conversation from the party where we all just want to have fun. So what I'm doing is I'm being very unpopular in a way by placing it directly in the room and say, listen, can we just remove this uncomfortability and deal with it one time so that we can all party? Because now somebody is actually being left out who shouldn't be left out because we are avoiding the conversation because it's a hard conversation to have. But it's a conversation that hip hop started with and will probably end with because when we reach this utopian society where everybody is equal, maybe we don't need it. Depends. Or it will definitely be something completely different than what it has been. Uh, I think we can definitely say that. So that's what I'm doing. I'm not saying, oh, these have more right to it than these people have right to it. I'm just saying we need to be, when we're speaking about privilege and so on, we need to acknowledge that for me, my personal viewpoint is that everyone who loves hip hop should also love Black Lives Matter, should also love fights against injustice, should also be, make their bodies an amplification of the struggle and fight that hip hop came out of. That's what I'm saying. As much as we all love to party, let's remember so that our, the noise of our speakers and our party doesn't drown out the screams which we have taken into our bodies and that we are now repeating in a way. That's, to be more specific, is my message. Not that this body and Maria has more, uh, what do you call it, right to it than what Marikin has to it. I, when we speak about investing, I think I've invested more and recommended Marikin for more jobs than I have Maria. And I'm sorry for that, Maria. I will fix myself. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's, but it's just a point of I am doing this thing because also now I have enough privilege to do it. And I'm one of the few bodies like myself who have amassed enough privilege to actually bring this conversation into the room. And part of my job is doing it. And if I become unpopular by doing it, I have enough body that even if you slice me, I'll still be big and fat and black at the end of the day. Uh, but I want to do it so that the generation that comes behind me is not stuck doing the same thing, speaking about status quo. Because I'm noticing that it's really hard for them to have that conversation. Again, because now we're, there's less language for it now than even it was in our generation, because there's a generation that went missing. The same as kind of in breakdance, when you notice when that's another discussion whether breakdance should be part of the Olympics or not, and blah, blah, blah. But when the Youth Olympics came, you had a problem suddenly because there weren't enough young breakers because there was a, de a generational gap. The same has actually happened in this conversation. There's a generational gap in this conversation. And that's also one of the things where we notice, okay, we have to address that for those of us who now sit comfortably in our artistries and can deal and we can have these discussions safely because of we're both quite secure in who we are for the next ones behind us that conversation would have been the end of it okay ways. so you're calling upon because i specifically thought i heard you said maria and then daniel and then austin which all of them are black yes because i was yeah. talking about the structure yeah the but structural and then, discrimination of black bodies even within the hip-hop field. I'm mm -hmm. not talking about who has the right to be in hip-hop. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about who is being discriminated out of hip-hop, mm -hmm. which is two different things. Do you feel, uh, if we can talk about the, the Norwegian uh, platform for just two, uh, two seconds, do you feel there is discrimination or that somebody is left out? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, I uh, I don't know because I don't have a good overview. But my personal point of view is that no, not in an on a personal level. But of course, there is structural racism, and uh, that's a big issue uh, all around the world. But uh, especially some places. But. Uh, I just appreciate what you said now, and my my um, answer would be nice in a way without diluting your um, message. It's good to merge that into your your point of view when you uh, express it, because your context is very white, and there's a lot of passionate people. So that's just my answer. 
I mean, you, we are in Norway, and there are most, I mean, most of the people uh, doing street dance in, um, in Norway, a lot of people doing it, listening to you, because you have a lot of nice things to say. Maybe we'll get that, and that was the conversation that we had at the panel talk I was referring to earlier. Maybe we'll misunderstand that it's structural and take it on a personal level. Uh, so it's complex because we all have to understand your message. So that's not what I'm saying. I, I'm just saying that I think that uh, maybe me, I can't talk for anybody else, but maybe myself, I, f I can feel that, oh, because my skin is not dark enough, I, I, I'm not, I don't have the, uh, the same right to, to approach the culture. I, I'm, I don't feel like that. Like, but I'm just saying that uh, this kind of um, elaboration, I think, is important, at least just here. Is it possible to talk about hip hop uh, entering the stage without us? Um, because uh, as I started my intro, it is a very, very. M this is a massive discussion. We need, a, you know, at least two years. Uh, <laughs> And, and there's so much like structural, um, you know, we can talk about racism, we can talk about who has the power, and all of these uh, pointers are definitely, you know, something that pushes or pulls or uh, closes for the art form. But is it, is it still possible to talk about hip hop entering the stage uh, without us getting uh, stuck uh, I see already now we're like uh, 45 minutes talking about, you know, one topic or, or one part of this massive, 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 you know. Can we talk about what happens with the art form when it enters this, uh, this the, the, you know, normative stage uh, room? Uh, what we lose, what we win, um, and so on. I think Thomas is first. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. Sean is first. I, was, I would say you cannot stray too far from what has been anchored in the room. You cannot, because um, if you are to understand, if you, if you do not understand the canon of hip hop, you're gonna feel separated. You're gonna wanna move on what you're talking about so we can have fun. You know what I mean? Mm. And in the essence of what we're talking about is, is a sense of um, incorporating it more on stage in institutions having a seat at the table, as, as one would say, having a seat at the table. And if you can't appreciate the canon of, from which it came, you, we're gonna feel that separate, the separateness. So you, you wouldn't, in terms of hip hop in itself, becoming a firm place within the institutions, if it's, if it, if it's not a core to our understanding, you're always gonna be somebody pulling over here, pulling over there. We need to make this conversation comfortable so we can move on. So we can move on. Or you're always going to be like, can we please just, yeah, you know I mean? So, yeah. Uh, can, I, can I say something? Uh, Thomas was, uh, oh. and then uh, Anne, I'll let you. Yeah, then I'll try to shorten it because I don't want to appropriate your voice. Um, no, um, I was specific in how I phrased it for a reason. And that is also because, and we haven't reached this point of the conversation in Norway, which is a problem. Tone policing is a part of this conversation, where some people's tone is absolutely policed because you may only bring your own struggle up in a certain specific way. And mm. uh, then there's an, another side of it is again the fragility, the other fragilities. That if I say this, then this and this and these people might feel. But I'm also point, I'm pointing out somebody's oppression. That I'm pointing out their oppression should not be a question of your personal identity, so that it goes there directly. That is so that's why I said I'm purposefully putting the friction in the room because my body can take the backlash because mm. I, so I can choose to blunder in. I can be a big fat elephant entering this conversation because the people behind me cannot do that. I can. So if you get angry at me, if you get angry at me, if others get angry, I can, I can very much deal with it because it's been my life for 25 years. Others can't. So somebody has to be also not likable because that's also the problem that you have to be absolutely likable in order to point up uh, oppression because if you don't say it in a way, and we know this from feminism, 
is a huge part of feminism also to be able to point out the patriarchy without having to do it in a way which is acceptable to men. So that, that's what I will say, I did it on purpose, not because I didn't know that some people will feel ruffled, they knew, but that's what's why I said, I'm specifically doing it so that others don't have to, because at some point it, that also has to be done, because if there's no room for that, then there actually is no room for certain voices in the room because they are being absolutely policed. So I, I will just say that, that I, I did that on purpose, and then I hope nobody was ruffled too much, it's just to take a look at our audience, or our classes, and you will see that they're extremely mixed. So yes, on stage now, now the company is predominantly black. For those who remember, the company was 30 people and absolutely everything mm. uh, and so on. It was specifically because we noticed that these bodies were nowhere else that we said, okay, this one company will make sure that these voices will be heard. And then we'll go in and support everybody else's voice mm. so that they can also be heard. And that's why I will have a fight when you're on stage for you to be able to represent hip hop however you want to, because that is also important. And the same way, it's the same fight for me, for more space for everyone. But that also means that at some point we will be touching each other. And, and that's also what I, the reason why I went into this is also because the conversation of what do we lose or not lose when it comes on stage feeds into this conversation, because again, it's who are allowed to put hip hop on stage. Um, I shouldn't say this, maybe, because of some of my hats, but I get frustrated where a lot of things, like has been pointed out, is presented as hip-hop, and then you come and you see it, and even the dancers performing it wouldn't necessarily tag themselves as hip-hop. The choreographer at some point has taken a little bit of hip-hop inspiration and sprinkled it onto it, but it's being presented this way. And then you see, again, it's a very specific body, it's a very specific aesthetics, it's a very specific way of using the stage and so on. And then you wonder, okay, but is hip hop allowed to come? Or are everybody allowed to enter the stage with hip hop? Or is it only certain bodies? So this, these questions for me overlap. And then what is lost, what not? Because that happened to jazz. There were uh, even the big ones we know, Gregory Hines, Sammy Davis Jr., Mr. Bojangles, were really upset about who were considered tap dancers and how this was entering Broadway. And the hoofers, which they call themselves, was left out because they stomped too hard or their body didn't have a balletic line on top and so on, so they were being removed. So for me, yes, this is happening again. And I think these two questions overlap. And oh, may I? Um, thanks. Um, I just want to go back to what you said earlier. Um, I think you're opposing uh, being uh, very political to having fun, Is that, uh, am I right? Okay, okay. Okay. Well, I just want to um, uh, talk more about how I see hip hop on stage. Because um, I, um, I, I don't think um, um, if you are going to do a performance uh, in, a, in, a, in a theater, uh, you should just be having fun. Otherwise, if you want to have fun, you can go to the club, which I also do and I love. So if I want to have fun, I'm not going to perform on stage. So uh, whenever I, I create a show, I want to uh, think about how do I see the audience. So um, you kind of, uh, Thomas said something about um, being uh, trying to provoke the audience so that they, they can um, uh, see another viewpoint, um, something like that. So that's um, possible uh, approach, but um, I um, I believe there's many approaches, and yeah, um, and so the thing is uh, sometimes we don't allow ourselves uh, when we come from hip hop to uh, take other approaches because we think uh, what's expected of us is either to be very uh, fun, fun and young and beautiful and like energetic. And so that's more like performance and show, so why not? Uh, or being very um, uh, involved in um, fighting for something, um, a very strong um, message. Um, I, for my part, um, um, believe in the abstraction, in the power of abstraction. And I think that um, the more abstract things are, the more metaphoric they can become and the more universal and the more you can relate. So what I do in my show, so I'm going to talk for myself now, um, is um, 
I uh, look at the bodies of the dancers, but I don't see the skin. I just look at the form of the body and the, what's being made. Uh, what what's the move? Why? What 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 does that make me feel like? And try to understand um, uh, how that relates to to uh, universal feeling and um, um, archetypes and stuff like that. And try to take that and destructure de it and um, put, in it, put it in context and put constraints on it on stage so that when the people come and see the show, um, they, they identify with the dancer. So for me, it's, imp it's so important that uh, the public can identify so that they can have more empathy and so they can feel like it would be them. And I, I've seen a lot of shows in France where um, hip hop um, shows where um, People are like, oh, that was a really nice hip hop show. Uh, where did they come from? Or, and so when, for me, when people come out of the show and say that, it's kind of a failure, failure because I feel like they've seen um, a folkloric thing, a transposition of something, like a kind of um, voyeurism thing. And I really, for my part, don't, um, don't like that relationship to the public. So. Uh, that's not uh, what I want. Uh, that if I, people want, wanted me to do that, I would not be a choreographer. I, I, I am a choreographer because, because I believe in uh, the uh, importance of um, the relationship between uh, audience and artist. And so I, I'm not saying you, that's the only uh, way of seeing the public and of addressing um, um, that relationship. But um, I think sometimes in hip hop we forget that we have to think about that, and that by not, by forgetting to think about that we um, forget a whole um, uh, um, perspective and a, a whole um, uh, array of things that we could be doing and that we're not doing. And also sometimes that's why people see us as limited because we always do the same things. Yeah. I, I mean. I mean, what's, what's really interesting about that is in my company, um, Foreign Bodies Orchestra, it's almost like I do opposite to a point um, in the sense of I look at who's in the room and I want them to, I want my dancers to bring every aspect of their being and not to set limits on that, not trying to wash it off and let that be a part of the the subject matter as well and a lot of my, um, a lot of my experience recently is becoming becoming more about being a director as well and working with playwrights and and other theater companies so coming from that aspect where it's um it's really concentrating on the context of what i'm putting on stage or the, i do address a lot of political um, issues issues around assimilation identity race and culture so hence that's why I, again everybody on stage is um bringing their whole culture and what I agree with as well what could be relevant more relevant to um, talking about what hip-hop can be doing on stage is yes not concentrating on replication of you know the form certain forms all the time it's having that confidence to put your art first what is your subject matter what are you um, addressing with your subject um, because then you know that's when things stop to grow Things stop growing because you're concentrated on satisfying a specific audience expectation. And as you spoke earlier on about, you know, it becoming more of a, a spectacle rather than an intellect. You know what I mean? Your intellectual, creative output. And yeah, I, I agree. I agree with you, Thomas. Yeah. Um, very shortly, just to clarify that one. Uh, I will also I will claim another side. I have Afro American Texas but I also have Trinidad and Tobago, which is a carnival nation. So just to claim that having fun is very much for me also part of resistance. Trinidad and Tobago is where carnival came from. It's one of the biggest festivals in the world and it's all resistance with a smile. Uh, so I would say I very much advocate both that smiling and having fun can be resistance and social commentary. And also that it's a freaking human right that we need to claim <laughs> as well. Uh, which I think is important to show that joy because it's not always showed or celebrated and why does less Mr. Robinson, why is that something more art than something that makes people laugh? 
for me, it's making people laugh, especially if they're in a situation where that is kind of hard to do. It, I don't understand why that's less art than making somebody who is extremely privileged go, oh, the poor are feeling so sad and this is touching my... I, yeah, there's something about this whole binary that is set up. And for me, that's also part of the potential, if we're going to talk purely potential of hip-hop, which also some of what we do. Um, I have not branded or marketed what I do as hip-hop for a specific reason. There were many political reasons for that. Uh, why I chose to put it on the side, but all the practices that we do are directly in that genealogy. Uh, so it's not unnatural for us at all to be in that space because we are in that space. But some of the things that is possible there is it allows us to, for example, address what we internally call the Serena Williams problem, which I think King and Maria and Marikin also all have touched on. If, if you're a woman and you're powerful, somehow that's branded as masculine. And the, these expressions also allow us to move that a little bit, to be able to claim femininity without uh, borrowing from the masculine or to disrupt this binary. It also allows um, our masculine sensuality to come into place. It is a different, uh, what we call corporate reality, a real different reality of the body that is, disrupts the, the image that is always put and repeated on stage. And for me personally, that's what one of the things I appreciate the most is these genres' ability to come in and disrupt that a little bit, to create a flow, actually, that allows it to move. And by the end of the performance, whether you call the battle a performance or the jam a performance or the stage a performance, a lot of people's perceptions of where these borders are have moved and shifted to some degree. And that's one of the things that I've, I've come to appreciate more and more. And even now, uh, the queer aspect has definitely come to Norway. It was less present before, and it's very present now. But that is creating another shift again. And I think to step in and talk about that as artistic poten potential, I think could be really powerful, because there we've actually come a lot further than a lot of other styles who would like to claim it for themselves exclusively. Mm -hmm. Where do we see hip-hop in 20 years? Uh, let's say we fixed all the structural problems. I'm painting a utopia. Let's say we're colorblind or color accurate. <laughs> yeah. Let's say we give credit to where it belongs. Where are we? Where is the art form in 20 years? Where do we want to be? I'm uh, to go back to the beginning of the first uh, conversation we had earlier today. I'm still a little confused where we, what we are talking about. Are we talking about hip hop culture? Are we talking about street and club dance? Or hip hop on stage? Hip hop. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and so, so again, yeah, because hip hop so on stage, do we exclude whacking then? Definitely not. Yeah, exactly. He says um, urban um, culture, so I think whacking would be included. Okay. That's me personally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm you know just, I, mean? uh, I just asked because I, it's a definition question that is important to lay the foundation of the conversation. Yeah. Because in, it's also for people here that are confused about what we talk about, maybe to clarify it. But maybe it's a digression that is not necessary. But uh, I'm just, uh, so whacking is a part of the hip-hop culture? It's for you to, <laughs> do you accept it? You can say it is. I don't know. I mean, I'm asking. I'm, 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 yeah, it's just an example of uh, where, what are we talking about? Okay. Are we talking about hip-hop on stage? Are we talking about hip-hop culture? Are we talking about street slash club dances? I started uh, my intro trying to say that this is about the dance element of hip-hop, but okay. we... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. seem to end up in the social context, mm. the, the political context, more than then we the use, dance form. Yeah, so we use the hip-hop you know now I mean? as expression the as Cultural, you, you use know. in France. Mm. It's the umbrella for all the styles. Okay, yeah, okay. Why not? Uh, okay, cool. I, I think, <laughs> so where do we see ourselves in 20 years? I think in 20 years, because of where uh, hip-hop came from, a necessity, a social, political necessity, um, it's that question on what will society be like? Would hip-hop be necessary? Would there be another form? 
once the young person who's studying hip hop um, has the privilege of, you know, um, becoming a, a mainstream member of society, earning a particular wage, their class being, um, their social class upgrading, hip hop becoming a norm, would there be another underclass that creates something akin to hip hop? Again, is that cycle that cannot be avoided. Mm. That's where it came from. So it's, it's just that consideration, where will society be in 20 years? as in terms of the, the need for hip hop, will it be necessary? As in contemporary and modern dance, serve a particular political point in time. Now where is it? It's cushy, it's nice, it's comfortable, some people would say. Mm. Uh, uh, the, con the context uh, of the country's um, culture structure or politics um, has a lot of relevance to where hip hop can be in 20 years because I see that um, hip hop is at a, diff a very different uh, place than it is here or maybe in the UK in France because in France um, hip hop is uh, become quite institutional. Uh, we have um, some hip hop, more or less, hip hop um, choreographers who direct um, uh, national dance centers. We have um, um, more and more of that. Um, I'm personally founded by the Ministry of Culture, and, uh, my company, and a lot of hip hop companies are, are, are uh, very much funded by, uh, by the Ministry of Culture. And uh, I haven't seen that it has been um, a loss for uh, hip hop culture so much. Um, but hip hop is moving, and uh, it's not moving at the same pace uh, everywhere, depending on, on all that. Um, the direction I see it moving uh, in my context and in France is um, we've done, uh, it's, it's been like 30 years since uh, I think 84 was the first hip hop dance show on stage in France. And uh, we've done a lot of stuff. Um, and um, sh I, being an artist, I don't like to see things uh, done over again or repeated. So where I see it going and where I want to uh, put it is um, seeing what hip hop uh, artists, people who come from hip hop, uh, can do with other disciplines, Be because um, uh, some t a lot of times um, um, the f when the f in the first shows where there was hip hop on stage, as you, as you said earlier, it's a contemporary choreographer with a little bit of hip hop dancers or some dancers who are a bit um, learned at hip hop, but, but are mostly um, dancers that can do a lot of things, so it's a very, uh, very di diluted. I've always um, myself tried to push in the direction um, that um, to, to have um, more experts, uh, hip hop dance experts on stage so that we can push the limits of the um, movement, we can push the limits of um, what does it mean, what does breaking mean, what does popping mean, what can we, how do we see it, instead of trying to um, mix everything under, um, with, um, contemporary dance or whatever, so oh, I'm not saying uh, you can't do it, but I, I like to, uh, I, I, I've seen it so much, that, that's the direction where I've pushed it uh, for myself in France, but now I've done it for 15 years, and I've done a breaking, uh, several breaking shows, popping shows, uh, who all um, were more than just um, breaking, they had um, a lot of um, complex uh, buildings in them, but um, what I'm doing now is, um, in my show that I just premiered, um, I have a ballet dancer, I have a Vogue, a Vogue dancer, a, a two walkers, um, contemporary dancers, hip-hop dancers. So um, I see it um, as, okay, hip-hop is not just technique, it's also a way of uh, seeing the world, it's also um, improvising techniques, and I think I've heard it in the first conversation, it's also a lot about... Um, uh, how you see people, how, how you connect, and and that can also bring something to other disciplines, and that's where what I want to uh, make it go to, personally. Thomas, you want to say something about the future, 20 years from now? Yeah. Um, like I said, my starting point is slightly different, is where in where it's often obscured. Uh, but it means that my starting point goes from the African coast and central into the boat and onto the um, auction blocks and in. 
which means if you follow that journey, you will see that hip hop, house, whacking, all of these styles have certain core practices that moved as rhythmical institutions almost across the ocean. And for me, futurism, which is very often is about, is sometimes about going back to move forward. I would like to see some of those practices returned to its core as the practices they are. And then I mean specifically uh, improvisation within a motif on rhythmical structure where the music could be live and the body is responding. And there's a dialogue between the music and the body where they're not necessarily viewed as separate. Uh, and then what I'm doing is not really about dance or non-dance, but there is a line of dancing well, or if what I'm proposing, I'm suggesting something, and the audience will instantly let me know whether my suggestion was accepted, if it was deemed as a good suggestion or a bad suggestion, and so on. So to, have, so to strengthen this process that is there, this communal investment into one. So even if there's one dancer who is dancing, it's not one person producing that moment. That moment is produced by everybody in the room and everyone is investing in it. In a utopian society, for me, I would see that practice severely strengthened. And where we would co go back to, for example, when we visit Senegal, which is interesting, um, others have been there, you will find an entire nation are investing in this rhythmical play together. I would like that to see that happen in a place like Norway, mm. where people would go from selling coffee to, oh, I like that rhythm, and they would run out, uh, and they would play to it, or in, like in Trinidad, where there's a line at the local Rimi, and you're wondering why, and they're saying, well, it's the cash woman's favorite song, so then everybody patiently stands and waits, because naturally she has to move her bottom, because it's her favorite song. For me, that's a utopian, approach where I was like, yeah, that would be super nice if we can go there, where we can sing in the store and nobody looks at us as if we're crazy. Um, <laughs> and grandma is popping and, yeah. if you and the little child is, I don't know, whacking or whatever. That, that for me would be the utopian future where those barriers are kind of put down. Matthias, would you like to say something about it? Uh, how now? far are we? Because I really have to go to the restroom. <laughs> So that's my uh, 20 minutes? When, when, huh? Two more minutes. Okay. Yeah, two more minutes. Okay, then no problem. <laughs> so I, I, I really like your uh, vision and uh, I, it's, even though you put your like comedian twist to it, I really agree. And I, I, I think one of my visions is the same. If it's the foot or the bottom, I'm same for me, but I see myself as a dance activist with hip hop as a tool. I'm in love with hip hop culture and street dance in general and I would love that that it won't disappear because the new generations find something new. I would love for us to pass it on and to see how it's, now it's already globalized. Really, like it's everywhere. And, and uh, I think if it's gonna be, if we can pass it on, in a good way, I think it will live on forever because of what it contains. And I think, uh, yeah, so I hope that it'll be there 20 years. And I hope that in Norway specifically that we, we will become a more physical and uh, uh, a, a physical society that has acceptance for moving and singing and touching and not in the Me Too way, but yeah. <laughs> Because, yeah, I think we need it. So, as I started by my uh, intro with, one and a half hour of what we use now is just the start on a lot of deeper discussions that need to be handled. Can we move forward and at the same time hold on to the past? Can we reinvent and at the same time make sure we don't lose the core? Can we challenge the structures enough to make sure that the bodies being left behind are included. Do we still have a political entry point of necessity and will the normative stage be the primary platform for that voice and art form for our future generations? Can we say that that was kind of like the summary of our talk today? Yeah. So, politician, yeah, politician. <laughs> send money this way. <laughs> 
and you'll see us in 20 years. <laughs> thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to the people at home. Thank you to Kuda, Barum uh, Culture House. That was Bergensk. <laughs> Barum Culture House. Um, uh, and uh, I'm very interested in where the future and where we're going and how it's going to be. Thank you so much. <laughs>